So uh, I would like to have our sponsors up on stage. Four of them, welcome up. And we need a microphone. So I will give you about 10 seconds each to explain why did you sponsor and what is so good about you and your company? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay, we start with Scania. Håkan Klein. Thank you. Yes, uh, Scania, we are making, making trucks and coaches and industrial engines. And we have been profitable since 1934. And we are very famous for lean manufacturing, but in fact, we also have a modular architecture. And I hope for the future, we're going to be knowledgeable also for management innovation. Thanks, man. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Next is Anne Frankly. And what's your name? Yeah, my name is Veronica. I'm actually three weeks into my position at uh, Anne Frankly. So Woo! this is new for me. Uh, but our tool you can use to trigger and measure employee engagement. And you got this. Great. So please try us out or... Come and see us. At the Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Next one is Azana. And Hello. your name, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is MP. Uh, before I get into the spiel, again, just should we all like clap and say thank you to Agile people for putting this together? This has been an amazing, amazing event. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Um, so Asana is a work and project management software that enables your teams to work together effortlessly in Agile. You'll hear from some of our customers today. We have one here on stage. And <laughs> Spotify is one of our biggest uh, customers, and I believe you all heard about how they run. So please come visit us in the corner. Great. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. You could talk a bit more because you said so nice things about the conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then we actually have our own Mikael Göte here. Yes, hi. <laughs> I'm Mikael Göte from CRISP. So that's my daytime work. At night, I organize conferences like uh, Yellow People. So, um, uh, and at the daytime work, then at CRISP, we are the Agile boutique consultancy in Stockholm. Um, and we've been working with Agile for so long. So we know that it comes to people, leadership in organization to succeed. That's why we support these kind of things with, with both time and money and events. Thank Great. you. Awesome. Thanks for sponsoring. <laughs> okay, now uh, we will move over to our uh, panel discussion for this year. We have six panelists, and I want you all up on stage now. So my thought here was that since this is a self-organized conference, I would like uh, my panelists to introduce each other, actually. And we will start with Dog and Dorna over here, who knew uh, each other from a long time ago. Uh, I think you have cooperated in the past. And uh, you are going to start to introduce each other. So let's hear. Donna, would you like to start introducing Doug? I will. I'm very grateful to be introducing you to Doug Kirkpatrick. I've known Doug since, I don't, we can't decide, but I'm, I'm thinking 2013. We most recently collaborated on a little book called From Hierarchy to High Performance, which is under Doug's name. Uh, just a whole bunch of us from Great Work Cultures uh, collaborated on that. Doug has been involved with Morningstar uh, Tomato Processing Company since 1990 when it switched from trucking to manufacturing. And in that process, uh, because there are no titles in a self-organized company, this one, Doug's role was, was uh, around financial controller. And uh, I did, I've done three interviews with Doug on my various podcasts, but one of them talks about how you use game scenarios to prepare your budget and then walk to the bank and get their agreement. So very innovative approaches, and it is with my great pleasure. Oh, and I have to say, Doug's latest book, which we also did an interview on, is uh, The No Limits Enterprise. And, and there's a whole lot of good stuff in here. The back end has got a template for how you can, you know, commitments you make to each other, which is, we always talk about accountability, but in genuine nature, it's, it's the commitment that we make. So, yeah. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Donna, I've known as a passionate and powerful and prolific um, podcaster, author, collaborator, 
and uh, thought leader. And she shows up in um, multiple communities, and we just seem to end up being together all over the world all the time, and, and it's been great. Um, really got to know her uh, when she was getting ready to publish a book called Decision Making for Dummies, I think, in 2013 or so. Um, but uh, her podcasts are phenomenal. And uh, just recommend that uh, you follow her if you get a chance. Thank you. Now over to James and Alice, who are going to introduce each other. OK, so I met Aliza this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, this is interesting to introduce somebody whom I've not met before. So we took about six minutes, I think, in the corridor, right, to have a conversation. And the thing that struck me from that conversation about you, to give a different dimension to, to who you are and what you're doing now, was you shared a story that I think is common for many and that led to an opportunity for you that doesn't necessarily arise for everyone, even though it's possible. And what I'm saying was that you shared about how through your own experiences of, of finding yourself constrained in various environments that didn't allow you to grow into your fuller potential and express who you were, through an opportunity where that became possible, you realize now that you were motivated to also provide environments where others could do the same. Yeah? And, and like any good idea, you bumped into the fact that that's not as easy as it might first seem. Yeah? And it seems to me that what we teach or seek to enable is the thing we also most need to learn. So I was reminded of Chiron, the wounded healer. And it's like through our own journey as life carves us open somehow, it inspires us to create opportunities for others to become more themselves as well. And that's what touched me most, because I think that's what drives you behind everything you do. And it was a pleasure to meet you for those six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and I, will, I hope we will stay meeting again. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That's a really nice uh, introduction uh, for six minutes only that you know me. Um, after our, I, I already searched uh, something of you uh, on the internet. <laughs> and if you look for James on the internet, then you see that he's a real traveler. He comes everywhere around the globe. And he does that because his heart... Is, um, is with people and he wants to help people in their change. You can better explain what sociocracy is than I can, so I leave that to you. <laughs> but if you, uh, if, you, if you look at him, at this picture for example, then you see a very open, humble and kind man. And if you talk to James, you experience the same. I experienced the same. And I only saw you for six minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I not saw you for six minutes, but I spoke to you for six <laughs> minutes. And, um, uh, yeah, and you can laugh at, at that. Uh, but it's not a joke. It's really, I, I'm serious about this. Um, and I think I can learn a lot from you. And I hope to learn a lot from you. And I'm going uh, to your speech afterwards. Um, so, James, thank you already for this. Thank you, Alicia. And over to Ari and Marina. <laughs> so, uh, Marina and I met at 12.40. <laughs> That's important for me. To compensate, we talked for eight minutes. Um, and one of the things that she said, what, what I didn't expect was, I love fishing. I said, okay, cool. And then she said, and that's what we share, I love being out there. You're being busy, traveling, right? Planes, transfers, airports, and then being out there. So this weekend, right, you were here enjoying the lake, the silence, and especially enjoying being alone, right? For, uh, what I liked the first thing that she said, you know, I, I got into this because Mike Beadle was my supervisor. And for those of you who don't know, Mike is also one of the authors of the Edge Manifesto. And um, sadly, uh, he lost his life a year and a half ago. So I think you're in a privileged situation, right? Very cool uh, from that perspective. Um, we were talking about traveling. Right? <laughs> and, 
and the pressure is on your life and uh, you know, getting a little bit of exercise and you know, the wrong diets all the time. And then she said magical words, I try to do my run in the morning. <laughs> try. <Not> try. <laughs> <laughs> Marina. Thank you very much. Um, Andre, uh, he was one of the persons who wrote Agile Manifesto. Thank you so much for, your, for, for that. Uh, he has more than 25 years experience in uh, Agile uh, and he helped with the Agile around the world, right? And three interesting facts about Andre. An uh, his first job was delivery babies, right? <laughs> Am I right? And during he wrote Agile Manifesto during two days, when he came, came back, he found his house uh, was on the fire and his wife broke him uh, with him, broken, broken with him. Oh, and yeah, yeah and he, he's always ready for changes, right? Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> like <that>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great introductions. Uh, we are moving on to the first little question. I gave you um, a small challenge, and that was to look at the Agile People Manifesto that we talked about earlier, and to actually uh, mention your favorite principle and why this is your favorite principle, or you can comment on any of them, actually. But uh, I know that James mentioned a specific one, and maybe you want to start, James, to elaborate on, on that principle that you mentioned to me. Do you remember which one it was? Well, I'm guessing meaning and purpose. But yes, yeah. it was meaning and purpose. Yeah. Okay. Well, the reason it jumped out for me is I've been inquiring into what meaning means for a while and why it might be relevant. And I know for me that many years ago I, I realized that pursuing what was meaningful for me is what gave me greatest energy and also gave me the discipline and the courage to see through the challenging moments and to persevere. Yeah, and when the going got tough, to keep going. And so more recently I heard it proposed that well, maybe there's a direct correlation between meaningfulness and the willingness to take responsibility. And I think today what we need more than anything is for all of us to take responsibility, you know, for the, not just as individuals, but also on the more collective level for the consequences of our individual and shared actions. Um, and I can't get past the fact that these two are so intimately related. And then I speak to people who kind of give the impression, at least, that what they're doing in their lives right now is less than meaningful for them. And then somehow that costs them and it takes energy. And, and even when the intentions they, their intention is to act with integrity, it becomes harder to follow through. And when the challenges come, it becomes more difficult to find that extra energy to persevere. Yeah. So I'm wondering, what, what would the world look like if we invested into, not just in our own generation, but in future generations, this prioritizing the invitation for human beings and our children to consider What's meaningful for you? What makes your heart sing? What are you passionate about? What's your unique contribution? And take a growth, approach to growth kind of mindset to growing our children so that they can arrive into adulthood fully engaged and energized to persevere. Yeah? Mm. And, and I think as a current generation, the challenge is, are you invested in what is meaningful, really? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Yeah? And if I'm not on a given day, what am I going to do about it? Because it's not just about self-indulgence, it's about responsibility for what happens next, both for us and those that follow. Mm. Very well spoken. Thank you so much. Who would like to continue on another note? Alice? Which yeah. one is your favorite and why? Yeah, my favorite is also purpose, but... Next to that, because you already taught uh, uh, about it. <laughs> uh, but next to that, it's the curiosity. Agile people are curious and collaborate to create awesome value and innovative solutions that meet human needs. And if you remember my slide about the children who were uh, jumping in the, in the water, um, everyone, I think, is born agile. And children 
have questions. They are curious. If you have little children, I have little children, and um, they, they always ask questions, a lot of questions. But what is it what we do? As a parent, I sometimes uh, find it, it, it's, it's not uh, at that moment, the right moment to ask the question, but that's in my head. So I sometimes say, uh, oh, sorry, not now, Thank you. later. And if children are going to school, then the teacher does that. We put children in a system. And after that, we start to work, study, work. And then we have another kind of hierarchy. And along the way, we stop asking questions and we stop being curious. And now we have to change that again. And that's very difficult, but it is necessary. Ask questions, don't feel stupid. And don't think that you are stupid if you ask questions. I sometimes think that. I also have sometimes a fixed mindset. Um, but I think curiosity is necessary to grow to the future for all of us. So that's my. Thank you, Alice. Beautiful. Um, anybody wants to go? Donna wants to have a say? Thank you. It was really difficult to pick one, uh, land on one, and you can imagine that when you look at the great work you, you did and that producing this is phenomenal. Uh, the one I'm gonna speak to though is the one that, uh, that relates more strongly to me in terms of what's going on in the world today, and that is uh, Agile People Connect deeply with individuals, business, and society to create a culture where human ability is nurtured, valued, and unleashed. And I chose that one because when you look at the depression and the anxiety statistics worldwide, which are absolutely absurd, the cost to the global economy is something like one trillion, but never mind the stats, look at the cost to human, to families, to human lives. And it, when you look at the root cause or the source, if you will, of, of what lies under depression and anxiety, it's gonna boil down to two things biologically. One of them is people's expression is being repressed that's the biological definition of it. And, and out of that co comes depression because they're not able to contribute. They're, they're, they can't see their place. There's, there's not that opportunity to contribute at a, at a deep and profound level. And, and, the, and, the, and the other thing that comes out of depression is disconnection. And so far, there's been at least seven different ways in which we can become disconnected. Disconnected from the self, disconnected from our values, meaningful values, uh, disconnected from other people, and, and so that's an opportunity, it seems to me, to, to restore some empathy to the conversations, the relationships, and, and really use the most difficult of times, which research tells us is the place where we actually do the skill development. It's not when things are just running along beautifully. It's when it's, the, the going is extremely tough. And that's the place where we can really ramp up how we connect with people across, whether the doorway is agile or some other path, but, but at least it's there for, for us to open it up and, and have a, a just deeply listen to someone else, particularly someone else whose views are just not similar to our own uh, or your own or my own. And, and really, let, and you know, teenagers are great places to start uh, because they are the ones that are most isolated in society today. So that's to me why I picked that one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe you pass it on to Dog, <laughs> and let's hear Dog's view. So I'd like to harness the power of boundary spanning and combine um, pursuing meaning with connecting deeply. Um, I think that connect, connecting deeply has a lot to do with helping others find their purpose and meaning. Um, Stockholm is the home of the Kestenbaum Institute, and Peter Kestenbaum is probably our greatest living philosopher of work. And um, it's, he would say it's high time we brought philosophy back into the workplace and, and really thought deeply about these concepts that we're talking about today. Um, business and society are concepts. Uh, connection is about human beings. And so it's about uh, the need to connect deeply with each other as human beings and help each other find purpose and meaning. 
And most of us experience work as an external constraint on life. Like it's, uh, I, I, want, I got my life, but you know, it's, it's impacted uh, and constrained by this, this work that I have to do to maintain my life. And when you can uh, reorganize yourself around purpose and meaning, you can uh, reorient your approach to an inside-out approach where meaning really drives uh, and propels you from the inside out. And work no longer becomes a constraint on life. You integrate work into your life. Work is just part of life. And so we get away from this dichotomy of work-life balance, and we start talking about life itself and connecting each other with that purpose. Thank you. We pass on to this side of the stage. We pass on to Marina. Yeah. I love all of them. And because it's about agile, agile it's about mindset. mindset. It's about how people are thinking. And I have three favorite. The first one is about collaboration and creation. And I will tell you uh, from sales perspective. And collaboration for... Um, of all organ for um, collaboration of all organization for creating value for customers and we work as a one team in whole organization because we have a one common goal to create value for customers and this is for me it's the uh, first one the second one it's about transparency it's about trust it's about self-organizing i really love all of them um, and imagine our self-organizing sales team uh, and when management trust them and I really love it love it and the second one and the last one um, it's about cross-functional collaboration I think I believe that the most important when we have collaboration between different departments when we understand each other when we support each other and everything it's about people that's why I really love it thank you so much thank you Marina Ari you're the last yeah. but not the least <laughs> thank you <laughs> So I was thinking about transparency too, right? So let, let's just take it also and add a, a little bit on, on yours. Yep. Um, for me, transparent. I always say, you know, when I do master classes or anything, transparency is the carrier of Agile. If the transparency stops, Agile is impossible. It's very simple. And um, uh, it's easily said to be transparent. And like traveling around the world, as we all do, right? You, you see so often that it's, cultural bound, it's a regional culture, it's a company culture uh, where transparency is very difficult. Even having you know, a Kanban board on the wall which demonstrates your progress, already people start feeling insecure. And I think we should recognize that transparency is a make or break in, in working agile and at the same time uh, there are so many impediments uh, in organizations if you want to bring them into an agile modus. And building the safety, which is also connecting, by the way, to, to the diversity, but building the safety where people feel free to transparent is essential, and that's where we all should focus on. So in terms of you know, being open and sharing, a role modeling, you know, being transparent from the top, uh, daring to be transparent at the bottom of the organization, and helping people to take you know, that one step to make that happen. Thank you, Ari. Very well said. I would like to move on to another question. And then uh, this one is about your uni unique view about uh, what is your recipe or your cure to the situation that organizations are facing today and uh, uh, where they find themselves in, um, in terms of the changes, the environment, everything that is happening. Uh, around the world today. What is your unique uh, cure? Who wants to start? Do you have a cure? Yeah? Yeah, the recipe. <laughs> Page 56 of the book, right? There yeah. you find it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I found, you know, sometimes I ask when people apply for a job at Humanity to be an edge coach, I always ask, why do you want to do this job? Because in three months, your client will tell you that you're a liar and you're a fraud and it's not true. Um, so, so why do you want to do this? Um, if you look at you know, how times have changed in, in 25 years ago, it was really like this. And, and now, I think what we have as, it's not a recipe, but it's something that helps us. 
you know, technology goes in such a pace, and technology has, you know, find its way, I think, into every professional domain that we know, from farmers to, to you know, hospitals, wherever you go, their, their technology is there. And if technology is in your professional domain, you know that you know, being able to, as a corporate, as an organization, being able to respond to that fast pace of innovation is essential. Otherwise, you, know, you, you don't survive. So I think we have now, it's not a recipe, but we have a little bit, you know, the wind in our sails, so to speak. Um, and if you, if you go into an agile transformation, and I think in this audience, it's easily received, but start focusing on the mindset. And when that's go, uh, then go into technology in your agile transformation, and then can, it ma can make you excel. But I see so many people doing a little bit at the bottom of agile, and then going into technology and expect miracles. And the mindset is everything. But what happened really? You say we have wind in the sails right now. We didn't have wind in the sails before, right? Not what has changed ago. that made this happen suddenly, the, the this paradigm the shift? Pace of, the pace of change has gone up so off, so fast. So you know, the last, if you see that, you know, what, what technology does, it disrupts entire business models in months. It makes products and solutions obsolete in weeks. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to respond. I think that's, and that's for us being, you know, adapted to, you know, addicted to Agile and wanted to bring it into organizations, that's the wind in our sails. Do, do you have another view? Somebody else has another view of why is this now suddenly happening? Because I think we all agree that something has changed. I've been saying this for 10 years, but now it's really true, <laughs> isn't it? That's what I feel. So do you have a, a, a view on that, James? No. What is different? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Because. I mean, I can say many different things. I can say it's because of this, it's because of that, but it's part of the, the, the situation is complexity itself. It's like everything's interacting with everything. And so the mystery of why we appear to be moving towards a more open public inquiry about these things is a bit beyond me. I think the technology is one side of it, but I've no idea. I mean, because I, I, just, I can conceive of so many answers to the question. And I wanted to tie that back to your first question around the, the unique view on uh, what's yeah. secure, right? Mm -hmm. because, because I think that's the other thing. It's like this tendency to look outside ourselves for the answer and the magic formula, mm -hmm. yeah, based on previous thinking, maybe more complicated thinking rather than complex thinking. Um, and, and actually, I think the answer is recognizing there isn't an answer in a way. And at the same time, there's such extraordinary wisdom available for every one of us and through those that came before us as well. Mm. And so, you know, a naive approach we were talking about in the lunch was, you know, oh, we'll remove all managers and we'll, we'll be self-organizing and no one will tell anyone what to do and it's all going to be fine. And that's like complete bullshit. It's like, it doesn't work at all. All that does is reinforce the argument for a management hierarchy, you know, or assuming the company survives at all. Yeah, and so what I want to say is that you know, one, one answer is, how do you take the wisdom of everybody who's come before and distribute that through learning yes. to more people and distribute the management function to more people throughout the system yeah, and support people in learning how to help themselves, whatever that might look like in a given context, yeah. Yeah, not only alone, but through harnessing the collective intelligence distributed through their, their peers. Uh, that was really interesting. We had a course in Zurich uh, last week, and I asked, so, so what is management? Is it a role? Is it a position? Is it a process? What is management? And then one of the groups came up with something new that I had never heard before. They said, management is a tool to be used by whomever in the organization when it's needed, in the way that is needed, right there, right then. I thought, brilliant, management is a tool. What do you think? Well, I'm not sure. I see management as a necessity. Yeah, okay. And I'm curious yeah. what Doug has to say. Doug, what's management? Is that a necessity, Doug? Do you agree? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, it's a social technology for getting work done. It's how work has always gotten done. It's how they built the pyramids, it's how they built the Great Wall of China, it's how we run companies. It's planning, organizing, controlling, selecting, coordinating. Planning strategy. Um, 
organizing's leadership, controlling's budgeting of time and resources, selecting's hiring and firing, coordinating's teamwork. It's, it's simple stuff. It's not rocket science. We all do it all the time in our own personal lives. So the question is, how do we do it in businesses in a way that affirms humanity? Yes. How do we do it in a different way than we have traditionally done leadership or management? And right. everybody's using this tool or this position or role or process every day in their ordinary lives. Okay, so uh, anybody else wants to pick up on that thread? Well, I, I don't know that I can pick up any better on the management thread that you've given, but I, I do know that that in order for us collectively to proceed, we, you know, I think part going back to the earlier question, what's going on? I think I think that there is a, a fatigue around the routine of life that that is now being pressured to shift stance, to shift perspective, to see so people can see themselves in a different way. I mean, when I have a lot of young people come up, they're really struggling with the question: Do I do this, you know, this linear trajectory of going to university, get a job? Do, 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 get, you know, do, the, do all the same routine thing, or do I be true to myself? And the fact that it's a di you know, that there's a, a, a divergence in that choice is, I think, is a pretty significant one. So I think more than ever now, people are starting to come to the place where they're being true to themselves. And in order to be true to themselves, it means you have to look at yourself differently. You have to look at your place in the world differently. You have to see yourself differently, not just as a nurse or a, a, a coach or whatever it is, but as a human being uh, and, and all of what goes with that. So we need to change the way we look at ourselves. Would you like uh, to comment on that as well? Yeah, uh, I was, when you were speaking about that, I needed to think um, about something that happened uh, to myself. Um, because I had, uh, lately I had a discussion with someone and um, uh, we were talking about that if generations grow older, maybe because they, they have a different view of the world. Uh, look at the challenges we have in the world, eh? the climate, uh, etc. How can we save our planet? It becomes more and more and more a discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's not longer on the background, but it's on the foreground. And I think that also makes that we are starting to change uh, and shift our way of thinking faster. And um, I had a discussion with someone, so maybe if people grow older and our younger generations grow older, then we don't have the problem anymore. I don't know if that is true because they face new things. Huh? Um, but what really helped myself uh, is the time that I could create my own purpose. Because it helped me to go away from thinking in small boxes of function profiles, uh, small tasks, uh, this is what I'm doing, this is what I do in my department, this is what I do in my function. No, it's not what I am. Mm -hmm. And my purpose tells what I am. And I did realize that and the, the trainer also said when I uh, created uh, the purpose, he said, be careful what you wish for. Because everything that you write down, because there's a whole story behind my purpose, um, everything you write down can become true. And when you create your own purpose, then you are going to live that purpose. Mm. And that's not about work or about family, or, but it's the whole. And that's also how I like to view the world uh, and also our organizations as a whole. We are all part of the system and we need to make it better. Yeah, we need to improve the system. Yes. Great. And I agree with Ari about agile mindset, that we need to change our mindset. An interesting question, why we need it? And my answer is that our customers, they changed the way how they buy. Usually now they know everything about our product, everything about our service. And we need to give them something more. We need to create some value for them. We need to understand what they really need and we need to do it faster than our competitive. And because in this way we will survive our business. That's why we change structure, mindset, culture and everything. 
Um, that's why this is my opinion from sales perspective. So learning becomes the only competitive advantage for the future. That's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, exactly. Learning about your customers, yeah. about your employees, moving faster, yeah, faster in that faster, learning. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, would you like to say something? Hurry? No, 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 not particularly. I thought okay. Right yeah. Left, so okay. I will. I will. Ke I will keep it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Oh, sorry. You said, yeah. yeah. See? Uh, learning yeah. about our customers, our employees, but also learning about ourselves. Yes. That's what I wanted to yeah. And that's maybe, maybe the most difficult thing to learn about yourself. Yeah, because I heard a phrase. You know, we have to change the way we look at ourselves. I think we have to start looking at ourselves. Uh, maybe we don't do that enough. Right, and, and yeah. it's, this is Look not applicable. Look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, this is not applicable for everyone, right? But uh, in, in, in any kind of situation, it's always about the other one. Uh, and it's... it's and I Look in the mirror, it's a horrible phrase. But, you know, just... I mean, you cannot change someone else, period. No. Right? The only one you can change it is you. So if you want the situation to improve, start with yourself. And I think too often... People are so afraid of, of you know, leaving their comfort zone mm. that the only thing they can do is you know, blaming someone else. I think we have two more minutes left. <laughs> oh, you're Thank kidding! You. <laughs> Forty-five minutes? This is ridiculous. It's close. Yeah. It's close. Okay. Yeah, well, you just started, right? So I, I have actually a question that I think is quite interesting. Um, if you could do just one thing for a company, what would that be? I know what I would do. I would try to increase psychological safety in that company because then it comes a lot of other things uh, because of that. Is there the one thing that you would... You can only do one thing. What would you do? What would you pick? Yeah, I would, it's a I would hypothetical I would, question. I would do safety I too. Safety is number safety. one. Safety? Number one. Yeah? yeah? yeah what do you yeah, say? that's a bit boring, but create trust. Yeah. yeah, safety. I think it would be to facilitate this conversation around meaning. Mm. To dare to do that yeah. and follow through on the consequences. Play. Play is one of the ways in which the highest form of human intelligence emerges. I don't think we do enough playing. Not I would. Easy, though. Um, <laughs> I would encourage leaders to get a worldview. So uh, that's what Peter Kassenbaum would say, for heaven's sakes, get a worldview. So if you believe that people are pawns on a chessboard and you want to be like Chainsaw Al Dunlap, knock yourself out, but you, if you believe in free will, like Immanuel Kant and lots of philosophers, that will lead you in an entirely different direction for the rest of your life. And it will change everything about how you approach work and society. Mm. One last thing I would like to... to uh, Marina, would you also like to uh, elaborate on that? Um, yeah. I would love to give freedom for employees for ma making decisions because I believe that uh, our employees know better how to achieve goals. Just give them freedom. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Last thing, your biggest fear for the future. What is your biggest fear for the future? Let's start with you, Doug. Um, people having nervous breakdowns from what Donna talked about, this massive anxiety. But we can overcome that by figuring out how to manage complexity with great simplicity and simple principles. Thank you. Donna? My greatest fear is that we do not take the opportunity in, the, in any point of crisis in our lives or in, in the workplace to dive deeper into the creative talent and work with it collectively. That's our, that's our opportunity, and my fear is that we do not mm. take it. Great, thanks. James? I don't know that it's a fear, because I kind of feel some sense of acceptance for what is, but my concern is that we will fail to realize what's possible and create the very worst of consequences for ourselves and maybe even extinct ourselves. Yeah. Oh, wow. When, yeah. when it doesn't have to be that way at all and the choice is entirely ours. Alice, your biggest fear? Yeah, if it's a fear, I'm not sure. Um, but sometimes, I, I, last year I uh, visited a lot of conferences, roundtables uh, and so ever, and we talked a lot about creating agility. 
um, and how we can change, uh, change our mindset. And sometimes I think, please don't let go our fun. We also, with everything we do, life is short. Uh, and sometimes if we, if we listen to all the things that's happening in the world, and yes, we need to do all something about that, but it can also be with fun. Mm. Thank you. What about you, Ari? There are very little things that keep me awake at night. Um, but the one thing, it's not about organizations or work or people. It's a simple one, but it's as horrible as simple. Plastic. I mean, the way we live and the way we, you know, everywhere you go, single-use plastic is dominating. It's much more around in, you know, out there in the environment uh, than we think already. And we have, as a human being, an inability to change. And we keep on producing and using and using and using. And uh, it scares me to shit if I see what's happening. Yeah. yeah. So Greta is right. Yeah. Um, Rob, uh, Robert, um, Roberts Instead People. How do you uh, um. spell it? Um, like machine instead people in the companies. So ah, uh, yeah. How to say in English? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Machines. I, I don't know. Anyway, instead people. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry. It's it's that we end up living in some globally totalitarian regime, like with the the supremacy of power shifting to the few through the absence of the many taking responsibility for themselves and finding ways to collaborate together to avoid that from happening. And it's the, it's the macro story of the micro one we're dealing with in organizations today. Extremely wise words. Me. Thank you, James. Any questions for the panel now before we finalize? Anybody has a question? Oh, over here. Yeah, I can see you. Who do you want to ask a question? Well, it's kind of for every, everybody. Uh, first, a comment. Uh, you guys are amazing. Uh, the perspectives you're bringing forth is uh, very refreshing. It's clarity uh, for all of us. Uh, my question to you, which is a kind of a big question, is it's all about people in the end, right? In organizations. So uh, the perspectives, the place that you're coming from, where did you get to that point? How did you get to that point? I didn't realize I had to run back with the mic. <laughs> Who wants to answer? <laughs> you want to answer. I want to share a story that I, I, I share uh, sometimes uh, on stage. When I made my change 25 years ago, um, answering really your question, right? When, when do you take that moment that you say, okay, this is stop. I was doing an, uh, the, the Dutch IRS, the tax office. I was doing a project, very traditional waterfall done as a, as a technical designer. And with 30 people working for seven months full time, it was, we call that, the project was killed, right? So you spend millions and then the project is stopped and never restarted again. So what the hell did we spend this public money on? Right, and that was my moment where I, I was really kicked out of the office of the client at 10.15 in the morning. So I was getting into my car and I thought, what am I going to do now? And I went to the office and I spoke to five of the six managers that we had at the time. I said, whatever you find for me for the next contract, I'm never going to do this again. And it's a choice, right? You're the architect of your own life and this is what you have to take. That's taking the responsibility. And I didn't want to waste public money. If you spend public money, it should be on, you know, on healthcare, on education and not being wasted by irresponsible people like this. That's making a change. I don't know if you answer your question, but the, okay, right? So that's my story. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else? No? <laughs> Great, Donna. Pia I think we need to save the rest of the answers until the coffee corner. I'm really sorry. Let's do for that. <laughs> you will have the opportunity to speak with all these beautiful people in the coffee corner later this afternoon. So give, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much.